Our text this morning is the, uh, the Old Testament reading in Ezekiel 17. I want to go back to that last verse. It says, And all the trees of the field shall know that I am the Lord. I bring low the high tree and make high the low tree, dry up the green tree and make the dry tree flourish. I am the Lord. I have spoken and I will do it. This is our text. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. It's a uh, Kind of a weird thing, but this reminded me of something uh, in Ethan's past. He'd probably remember this better than I would, but uh, when he was little, he went to uh, vacation Bible school. Uh, well, it was at the same school he was going to at the time. I don't know how old he was, maybe kindergarten or something. And they were finger painting. Uh, and he had this uh, gray piece of poster paper. It was kind of dark and dreary looking color. I don't know why he picked that one out. And on it, in his finger painting, he made a black cityscape, uh, just a bunch of buildings. Um, it, it looked a little bit Dr. Seuss maybe because, you know, he was little. But uh, it, was, it was okay. It, he kind of had an idea what he wanted and he did that. But it was black on gray and it was kind of dreary looking. But then, you know, as, as I came to look over his shoulder, he uh, stuck his finger in the red paint and just drew a little swoosh of red, bright, bloody looking red on the top of this thing, like uh, at the top of one of the buildings. And, and I don't know why it was, but it turned the thing into some jerry looking painting to something that was, it appealed to me as just about perfect. It was rather weird. And I, I figured, well, why did he do that? Uh, and you know who knows why he did that? He was inspired uh, by something or other. And then, of course, right after that, he was inspired to put his hand in something else disgusting and squirt it all over the You know, as Ethan. Uh, but it, he was inspired there, and it was kind of amazing, really, for a moment. And here in Israel, in this uh, prophecy from Ezekiel, you get kind of a parable. God is painting another picture like he does in word pictures sometimes, a parable of sorts. Jerusalem is, at this point, either wrecked or being wrecked by the Babylonians. The exile is in progress on the way to Babylon. Ezekiel kind of uh, is the prophet that rode through that mess uh, a little before and through the process and then even after a little bit. And um, so that's what's going on. Uh, and, and then you get this very positive parable of promise when, when God built his city the first time, and, and he claimed credit for that. I just think you should know. He, he got the people of Israel to haul cedar from Lebanon, which is where the great cedars still are. Uh, and uh, uh, he, he, he talks about cedars here, again, the great cedars, and he's talking about the ones up in Lebanon where they got the stuff the first time to build uh, everything there. Uh, and, and they had, he got them inspired also to uh, bring stone in from the quarries, which was kind of a long run. Uh, I don't know what you do with a 10,000 pound piece of granite, or I guess it was all marbly sort of granite. It's really nice stone. You can still see a little bit of it on the western wall there. Uh, but they had to take these gigantic rocks and they had to cut them like uh, a giant rollers, right? So it was like log shaped, except it was smooth. And then they would get them there and then they would chop off the edges so that it would be square because they didn't have to roll it anymore. But they're the great big giant things that they had to haul there. And God inspired them to do that because they wanted to build something beautiful. So then they had uh, their, their uh, the city walls and they had uh, their temple and they had the, the palace of the king and all that stuff was built and beautiful. And now here we are and it's all gone because they were thoroughgoing knuckleheads. Uh, senators of horrible arrogance brought low. They were... Uh, you know, in the words of Ezekiel here, they thought they were high and mighty, uh, and uh, he made them to be low. And now he's saying that he'll turn that all around himself, 
and, and make it new. Now, um, obviously he can do that, uh, and he kind of gives you an indication of uh, how he's going to do that, but it's a little cryptic because it's a parable, you might say. Uh, but how, how can he, after all the things that they did, and after he went to all the trouble of destroying the place, and he hauls them all off to Babylon, for 70 years they're there, why, why would he actually want to put that back? Because you know, as we sit here, we know that they didn't get better. They still sinned horribly, just like we do, and they still didn't get the message, and they still wandered off, and he, and he promised he was going to put it back anyway. I don't know if you do that, uh, uh, but do you ever worry about that for yourself? It's, we have the same problem. Uh, uh, honestly, you know you do not do what you should do with any effectiveness. That's just the nature of who we are. And how many sins do you think you've committed already today? I mean, if you just had to try and count that up. You can see how that would be difficult, right? Because half the time you don't even know you're doing it. And the other half, you kind of let yourself doing it. And every once in a while, I say, oh, forget it, I'm doing it. Uh, that's the way we do all day long, every day, for all of our lives. That's the way we are. Uh, exemplary life is not really anywhere close for any one of us. Now, you may suppose, looking at that, that uh, those transgressions of yours are small compared to what old Israel was up to with their oppression and their idolatry and their corruption. But the wages of sin look all the same to God. He doesn't say the wages of sin for Israel because they're really bad is this and the wages of sin for everybody else is something different. Uh, and if you go look at all the different sins that he names, they are almost all of them death sentences. Um, and in any case, that's the eternal consequence for every sin, every single one. So how is it you're going to come out any better than old Israel? Well, you'd have to say not so much. So why would God do anything but hammer us all into hell? Because that's, I mean, that's what we deserve. That's what seems like it should be. Uh, but he rebuilds his church in this passage. And, and it's kind of a stunning thing because uh, the, of the circumstances that he's talking about this, it doesn't make any sense really. Uh, a new tree planted from on high from those mighty cedars and, and, and eventually this is all designed to shelter you and me and uh, you all know you are a dry tree, which it, by all reasonable sense should be brought low not hardly worthy of kindness, let alone mercy, which is all you can say about this kind language. Why would he do that? Well, and it is a little mysterious when he paints all the pictures and parables. But the full solution and the complete explanation for this parable is Christ. I think if you look at all the parables, you'd probably find that was true every single time, no matter where you find them. That seems to be always the case. But uh, he was sent from on high, sitting at his father's right hand, uh, plucked from there by the will of his father to, to do some things, to be made low. Because, I mean, it's a long way, a long trip from the right hand of God to a mere human being, humbled into human flesh, and given into the hands of sinful parents and surrounded by sinful people all the time eventually only to try and destroy him is certainly not noble beginnings because it's all in poverty in a poor place uh, it's, it's confusing planted by God's own hand to the people of Israel and not as anyone would expect and, and not to serve himself on earth or any of his own particular needs here, but for no other reason but to save you, to serve you, to care for you, despite who you are, despite what you do, that's what he came for. God planted that tree. And he further planted Jesus on a tree at Calvary. So, you know, there's a little passage in Leviticus that says, Cursed is a man who was uh, born up on a tree, hung on a tree. 
And that's exactly what he did. It's a different kind of tree, I suppose, but he went there to die. And then he was buried, only to rise again to life. This, this is how God chose to rebuild his people. His church, his bride, his children, by the planting of Christ in death to bring forth the fruit and growth of his bride. You are his beloved people. By his own planting, by his own effort, by his own doing, because whatever we do will be a mess. You are his people. And you have grown large like this tree that he plants on the mountain that grows branches, etc. Uh, that grows large in his hand. The church has grown like crazy uh, uh, to shelter his chosen and rescued people within. That's the way it is in this world. The number of Christians is almost countless all over the place. Even in places where you'd never expect to find them. But that is the nature of God's tree. He plants. He grows. He causes it to be what it is. He's the one who makes it go. You are not here, not chosen because you are worthy in yourselves, effective in yourselves, uh, but because of God's love for you. That's how you came to be his children. And, and it's all for that impossible love that his son died given for you to be your forgiveness. And the tree that you have become together, the great bride of Christ, is his own living, green, miraculous tree of life and love in this world. But still, is a bit of a mystery here. Why does he say all this? I mean, you know, the timing is weird because he's hammering his people and sending them off to Babylon for a long, long time. Uh, the people that go are mostly not going to be the ones that come back. 70 years is a long time. Why does he say this here? There's, it, this is an exile. This is well-deserved. The, the, the timing is weird. It's a low, dry tree for sure that he's talking about here. But there's his tree restored miraculously to the mountain that is Sinai, not Sinai, not Sinai, Zion. Don't laugh at me, Kathy. Oh. <laughs> Zion, where Jerusalem sits. And on top of that mountain also, uh, he plants another tree and he puts his son on it. That's at the, at the, the, the side place there called Calvary. But it's up on that mountain too. And then that final day, that final perfect day when Jesus comes again, there also will be the tree of life. And so he will gather us up and make us whole and perfect exactly the way he wants his tree to be. He is the one who plants. He is the one who saves. He is the one who grows. He is the one that bears its fruit. He is the one that brings you home. All him, not you, him. For all of these things, or else it could not happen, because without him you can do nothing. With him, everything is possible. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.